John the Baptist again this week, Gospel of John. And uh, we're not talking about Brother John Swink, we're talking about uh, the cousin of the Lord Jesus, John, John the Baptist, the other John the Baptist. So, Gospel of John, Gospel of John this morning. And I uh, just want to mention a, a, a couple of things. Don't feel like if you don't, um, if you're not a chili person, if you don't make chili, that you're not invited to come to Chili Cook-Off. Our goal is, Josh, you make chili, right? I make the best chili. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Pastor, I'm sure you'll finish it off. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Okay. Frank, you make chili? I do not. <laughs> yes. Frank's a grandfather. He had a grandbaby last week. Yeah. Good job, Frank. <laughs> now learn to make chili. That was hard work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a proud grandpa, so ask him all about it. 7'7", seven, 7 pounds, seven, 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 7 ounces, 7 year old boy, no, 7, seven, seven pounds, 7 ounces, and uh, oh man, I, I know the name. Atlas. Yeah, Atlas, I knew it was some like, yeah, I can make chili name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, congratulations, that's Thank wonderful, you. isn't it? It's a wonderful thing. Uh, <clears throat> seriously, you're invited, uh, even if you don't make chili, you better show up. And uh, make sure that you show up and, and uh, invite your friends and family and anyone that you can get to come. And again, it's, it's not going to be, I promise you, it's not going to be one of those overbearing religious atmospheres. You ever gone somewhere and you're like, wow, you know, they really got me here. I used to have, I don't want to get mean here, but I used to have friends growing up who were charismatic. And sometimes I'm like, oh man, they're about to do something. <laughs> I'm just like, oh. Hey guys, come on. I remember my friend, we were water skiing one time, he broke his arm, and they wanted to heal him. I'm, I'm like, just let him alone, you know, he broke his arm. <laughs> leave, leave, leave the guy alone, you know, he's, he's scaring my friend. So, anyway, don't go water skiing with me, but you can make chili. All right. Um, seriously, let's, let's make this a good event and have as many folks come as we possibly can. Well, we'll have capacity for probably uh, 60 people or so in here to come, and that would be just a great turnout. I'd love to have about 60 people for our, our chili cook-off. It's a salvation celebration for us, so be thinking about probably if we have a good turnout, we won't have enough time for everyone to share their testimony, but we'll have enough time for you to share your testimony. And so be thinking about a way that you could just talk about just how you were saved. And it's really easy to do. Just tell what happened. Don't embellish it. Just be real simple about it. Maybe tell what happened. You can think about it as two points. This is how I got saved, and this is this is the difference it's made in my life. This is what's happening. This is what God's done. And you just think about that, and uh, it could just be as simple as, yeah, I'm at a chili cook-off now, and I've never been here if I wasn't saved. It could be just that simple. And I really just describe a lot. How many of us would be friends? How many of us would be family and know each other the way we do if it wasn't for Jesus saving us? Not, none of us. We just wouldn't have that common bond, but we're one together in Christ. Well, here we are in John chapter 1, if you found it, and we're going to look at uh, really what made John the Baptist the greatest man who ever lived, and we'll see a couple of things by way of conclusion that I think will encourage your heart about greatness. In verse 15, we see again, we'll read about John. John bear witness of him, this is speaking of the Word, or the light, which is Jesus. John bear witness of him and cried, saying, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And now look down with me, if you will, <clears throat> to verse 29 and 30. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. So let's pray. Father, it's our desire today. We want your help for us to really understand when you said that there wasn't a greater man who's ever lived than John the Baptist. God, first of all, help us to know the one who's preferred before him the way that John did. And then, God, I pray that You would uh, help us to understand what greatness is. And, Lord, may we achieve it. 
may we achieve your, your definition of greatness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, John's an interesting person to me. Uh, you know, the New Testament talks about and covers the life of John really so little that when we talk about uh, Bible in individuals, individuals who are reported or accounted in the Bible as being believers, uh, they're just not people we think a lot about. For instance, King David. King David gets a lot of coverage in the Scripture, doesn't he? Old and even, in a sense, New Testament. Because when we are introduced to the Lord Jesus, we're introduced to Jesus through the lineage of David. You know, I mean, David is seriously covered. Abraham is a guy, you know, that is mentioned over and over again, Old and New Testament. Moses mentioned over and again in the Old and New Testament. Oftentimes, the apostles, when they would pen letters to churches in the New Testament, would mention Isaiah. Man, Isaiah got mentioned a lot in the New Testament. It's usually spelled in the New Testament E-S, Isaiah, but Isaiah or Isaiah is mentioned over and again in the New Testament. Noah's even mentioned a little bit. If you ever read, uh, you ever read, you know, just the, did I say Noah? Jonah is who I intended to say. Noah is mentioned in the New Testament. Man, I'll tell you what, I've got to preach fast and, uh, and as directly as I can this morning or you folks are in a lot of trouble. <laughs> when, when I get names like Noah and Jonah mixed up, I don't know if that's my Lystexia kicking in that makes me do that or what the deal is, but there are names that just, I, I switch. Um, Greg and Glenn are names that I mix up. You tell me your name's Greg or Glenn, I'll never know which one it is. Uh, and another one is, uh, well, I can't remember, so whatever. <laughs> there are just things like that in my life that are hardships for you to deal with. And so, <laughs> oh, I'm over it though. So, but anyway, when we're talking about Jonah, you can read the book of Jonah in just a couple of minutes. Just a couple, four short chapters, four chapters. <laughs> I'm really having trouble. A couple of short chapters to read through Jonah. And uh, yet he's mentioned in the New Testament again. And so there are individuals that you look at and you think, man, if I could pick a person and that I kind of, you know, would see myself as, you ever see, when you read Bible stories, you see yourself as the Bible character when you're playing. I mean, I'm King David every time, you know. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm mightier than all the mighty men, you know. Uh, but when I see myself as people, or I see character in man, I'm just like, you know, I want to be that kind of guy. You know, there are a couple of guys on my short list. One of the guys is Jonathan, Saul's son. Jonathan, Saul's son, is probably one of the most baddest dudes. <laughs> he probably likes that description, right? I, you talk about a, a tough guy. I, I admire tough guys. I don't like weenie, wimpy guys. It just doesn't go well for me. But Jonathan, he's a man's man, you know? Hey, he says to his armor bearer, Let's go, let's go up to the garrison of the Philistines and fight them. A hundred guys. Let's go fight a hundred guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a bad dude, right? You know, and thus, you know, you, you look at his military exploits. But the deal about Jonathan that just, it used to just break my heart when I read about him. Like, this guy was such a great man. And because of the sin of his father, he got rejected from being king of Israel. But Jonathan models the man who realizes that who God wants you to be is greater than man's conception of what greatness is. Jonathan knew if God didn't want him to be king of Israel, that it wouldn't be great for him to be king of Israel. He was never bothered by the fact that though he was Saul's son because of his father's sin, he was rejected from being an heir to the throne. Never bothered him in the least. He was loyal to God. He was loyal to David. And he just realized that God's plan for my life is better than anything. You know, a lot of times we want to be something different than God wants us to be. And a man being in the center of God's will and content and lacking nothing. I look at Jonathan and I'm like, what was wrong with him? You know, just get rid of his dad and put him in place. What a great man he was. So he's one of my guys on a short list. I'd give you a lot of other reasons, but I just admire Jonathan. Just nothing in the Bible that says anything negative or sinful or wrong about Jonathan. A pure, godly, courageous man who was content to be who God wanted him to be and never looked anywhere else. By the way, we're not preaching a men's message this morning, but men, you just be the man God wants you to be. That's the greatest thing you can be. You be a good man. You be a good husband. 
You be a godly father. You don't need to be like anybody else in the world. You be the person God made you to be, and you can be great. John the Baptist is my New Testament guy. I like Paul. I mean, to be quite frank, Paul's wit and uh, his depth. I like him. And by the way, Peter would be like my best friend. You know, he'd be that guy that's always getting you beat up. You know, <laughs> because it was something he said. But actually, what I like about Peter is, is you look at his life and you see the stages of growth. By the time he pens that second letter, Second Peter, there is a fully mature, seasoned man who is in control of his temperament, and he just embodies what a godly man would be. But you still know he'd whack off somebody's ear if you crossed him the wrong way. So he still has that edge. I just I like Peter, don't you? Just really likable guy. And by the way. Peter is relatable for all the wrong reasons. But, uh, you know, I'm like, you know what? You know, I can mess up just as good as Peter could. You know, and I could say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing just as easily as Peter. So he's relatable. I appreciate Peter. You know, but my New Testament guy is John the Baptist. In other words, if you want to just aim for the top. And it's, it's John the Baptist because of what Jesus said about him. Will you please go to Matthew? Just go back. We're in, we're in John, so it'll be Matthew, Mark, Luke. Go back to Matthew chapter 11 and look at verse 11. So stick sticks. 11 11. Somebody needs to start a convenience store called 11 11. <laughs> and 7 7 11. 11 11, Matthew. I had a really nutty college roommate. Uh, my, my, I think it was my sophomore year of college. And he would, out of the blue, just scream out stick sticks whenever it said 11 11 on the alarm clock. So, I don't know where that came from, but stick sticks, two sets of sticks, is his favorite time of the day. And so that just stuck with me and messed me up in the way that I think and relate to people ever since. Verse 11. <laughs> Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater, <coughs> excuse me, than John the Baptist. And uh, maybe you can mark a place there, slip your bulletin in if you don't have a marker in your Bible. But stay there because we'll come back to the second part of that verse. And please don't read it right now and cheat and come up with my conclusion. This morning you'll ruin the message. We'd have to go home early. So, uh, but, but Jesus said about uh, John the Baptist that, Verily I say unto you, among them that, have, that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Obviously implied in the among them that are born of women is a human element, right? Was Jesus born of a woman? Yes, okay. So, except for Jesus, there was no one born of a woman who wasn't just a human, just a man. And that's what Jesus is referring to here, is the humanity of John the Baptist. He was human. He was just a man. Let's stop just for a minute and remind ourselves that though, you know, we ever use the phrase, in the Bible, in the Bible, you know, like, like you know, you got open your Bible and there's all these little characters running around there, living there in this little world that wasn't on planet Earth where we live at. You know, Bible characters are simply individuals uh, that God recorded their life and used them for us for an example. Uh, they're really, they're just people. And had you been alive at a different day, it might be that you'd be one of those people that, you know, got mentioned or was a significant part of being used in the Bible. God doesn't give us revelation, doesn't give us the Word of God. Today we have the entire, well, I have to be careful how I say that. Don't take that sentence out of context. But, uh, uh, God gives us, or God, God has us today living in a time when we have the entire revelation of the Scripture. And so Scripture is not going to be written about us. We're not going to be included that way. But what you do is recorded forever in heaven, the things that you do for the Lord Jesus Christ. So God has an eternal record of it. It doesn't need us to be mentioned in the Bible. But when I think of characters or individuals mentioned in the Bible, I just think, wow, you know, it's pretty, uh, those are subhuman or superhuman uh, individuals. You ever feel like you know the people that are mentioned like a Daniel in the Bible? How many of you would have the courage to pray with your window open every day after it's decreed, don't pray to anybody but the king? And Daniel prays every day with his window open facing toward Jerusalem and there's a decree made and Daniel goes and he, and he prays just like he always did. And he gets thrown into the lion's den. And what's the joke that people make between reading between the lines or whatever? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we read between the lines. And uh, anyway, that's for you, Brother John. For yeah, you and Andrew, you're the only ones here that can appreciate it. And you'll remember it, too. So, 
All right. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that, you know, we look at a guy like Daniel getting taken captive as a lad, probably 10, 12 years old, and saying, you know, we can't defile ourselves with the portion of the king's meat. Here's what I'm proposing to people that don't negotiate. You didn't go to Babylon and say, you know, let's, let's talk about this. No, it was like, shunk. They didn't need to get a letter giving them permission to whack someone. They just did when you crossed them. So Daniel has the courage to, to stand on multiple occasions. I look at Daniel, I'm like, you know, I don't know. You know, I, I, I dream that, you know, I would do what he did in that situation, but I'd probably close my blinds and pray. Couldn't God hear you with the blinds closed? Yeah. You know, <laughs> You know, you couldn't you pray in secret? No, Daniel is a good example for that. And sometimes we look at, at individuals in the Bible, and our thought is that, you know, this person was special in a way that I never could be. You ever feel like that? Yeah. You know? I mean, I hope all you guys, you know, are like Jonathan. You're like, let's go tackle 100 guys. You know, I, I just, I hope you're like that. Yeah, you need to have some common sense. You know, you need to know God wants you to do it. But I, I, I just think courage is something every man ought to have, even though it's not natural. You ought to develop it. Now, we lack it a lot. I admire courage in, in individuals in the Bible, but sometimes I see people are so courageous, I just think, you know, not me. You know, they said about David, Saul has slain his, ten, his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. David was a warrior. I mean, just a, he was on the next level, and then a couple levels up from that. You know, not most people could be like that. But the greatest man who ever lived, you could be like, or greater than. And I find that to be really encouraging. In other words, in Jesus' estimation, nobody, nobody knows the hearts of men better than Jesus. And no one has a better estimation of what God sees and what God values than God the Son. Is that right? Okay, so from God's perspective, we're going to define greatness then, right? Greatness is what God says greatness is. There are people who think things are great, but they're not. Now, I don't want to ramble too much, but let me illustrate that. Have you noticed that villainy is, in our era, um, looked up to? I don't watch them because, one, it's just not my thing, uh, but two, because of content that's just not appropriate. But I'm told that the latest Batmans, Batman is no longer a virtuous individual. Is that true? Like he has to kind of cross over to the other side or something like that or do some things that are sort of... Am I wrong about that? Some people look at me like, Pastor, you're wrong about Batman. <laughs> Nobody else here has watched Batman, okay? Well, how about this? I've watched Despicable Me. How many of y'all watched Despicable Me? Despicable Me, okay? And uh, uh, villains in that movie... Now, I, <laughs> I'm not like, you know, go home and smash your you know, Despicable Me. Uh, videos or whatever. But isn't it ironic that we think that villainy is cute in a cartoon? In other words, a person stealing or doing evil things, they are the people that we think are wonderful in that. I remember the first movie that ever did that was a movie I didn't, an animation movie I didn't really want to watch because the title, Monsters Inc. I'm scared of monsters, right? But monsters are cute and adorable and fuzzy and, and a good thing in Monsters Inc. All right. Now, this is not my message, okay? So don't go off and, you know, oh, you know, pastors against, you know, all of the animation movies and so forth. Of course I am. I'm against everything, right? <laughs> now, but isn't it ironic that in our culture we have switched from calling evil evil to calling evil good mm -hmm. and calling good good? And, and really, I mean, back in the days of the Lone Ranger, I mean, it was really, really clear to find bad guy, good guy. Good guy wears a white hat. Bad guy wears dark clothing. And so you know he's bad because he wears a dark hat. Nobody would do that in the sun unless they were bad and their brains were cooked or something like that. <laughs> I don't, but the reality is, is, you know, it's like it was black and white, right? It was, it was good and evil. And the lines are blurred today. It's just everything every couple of years that was not debatable in years past is now like, well, you know, it's, it's not bad as long as you're nice about it. Or it's not, you know, bad is redefined. Okay. We need to be very, very careful as believers. Hear me now, this is the point. We need to be very, very careful to see things through the viewpoint, from the vantage point of God. Amen. 
And so we need to be very, very aware of what God's Word says. God speaks through His Word, and in His Word you have His mind, or His mindset. And so when you study the Word of God and you see God sees things this way, then that's right. That's the standard that we'll all be judged by. We will not one day say, well, God, you know from the vantage point that I had, this is what the world said was good and evil. No, God says, well, you know, you're not there anymore. I'm from an eternal vantage point, and I'm the judge, and I determine good and evil. So know what God says is good and evil. I've said many, many times, and I hope that it's become part of your thinking, that we as believers ought not to have a cultural viewpoint or vantage point. We ought not look at things from the uh, world's culture. We ought to look at things from biblical culture. What does God say? And then that's, that's my opinion. That's, that's my position. God's right, my friend. It isn't a matter of, well, you know, I'm going to agree with God so I don't get judged. No, it's God's right, and so I'm going to agree with God so I can be right about it. Okay, so God said, Jesus said, that there was no man greater than John the Baptist. Will you please go to John chapter 3? Now, if you would please, John chapter 3. And... Um, We see it in this light, if you go down, if you will, with me to uh, chapter 3, verse 22. This is after Jesus says, and we'll be there in a couple weeks after he's, he's explained that, how to be saved to Nicodemus. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there. Makes good sense, doesn't it? Probably means he didn't sprinkle people either. Uh, and they came and were baptized. All right, verse 24, For John was not yet cast into prison. So we see a brief period in history where the ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of Jesus overlapped. They were both doing the same thing at the same time. Jesus' disciples were baptizing, and John the Baptist was baptizing, and he was near Anon because there was a lot of water there. And so it was a good practical place for baptizing. Who were they baptizing? Believers. that Individuals that believed the message that John the Baptist had, which was, he that is come after me is preferred before me. In other words, what he's saying is that, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. We read today, this is the one that I said, he that has come after me is preferred before me. This is the Messiah. This is the Anointed One. This is the Lamb of God. So John the Baptist is baptizing people that receive that message. And what a glorious message it was in that day. As yet, Jesus Christ, His ministry, had the miracles that He was going to do that showed that He was without question God. And Jesus' ministry wasn't fully known, wasn't in full swing. But John the Baptist's message was He was supposed to be Elijah that came or foretold the coming of Jesus. He was that Elijah. We'll see that next week. We'll look at John the Baptist as Elijah next week. But John the Baptist here, his message is, he that is come after me is preferred before me. And now their ministry is overlapping. Okay, now look at verse 25. Then there arose some questions between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. What were those questions, Pastor? I don't know. Verse 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So now, these individuals, the disciples and the Jews that are, that are uh, debating, purifying, they came to John and they said, the guy that you baptized beyond Jordan, he's baptizing people and he has more disciples than you. Now, this is an oh-no uh, moment for anyone trying to build a great ministry. <laughs> right? Isn't it incredible? Isn't it incredible that uh, believers can see other believers or other church bodies as competition? It's just, it's just, when you think about that, just, you know, a little bit. It bothers me when I see uh, people following false teachers. It bothers me when I see Jehovah's Witnesses working harder 
at getting their message out than people that have the truth do and seeing people convert. It's, it's tragic. It's really heartbreaking. Same with the Mormons. But you know, other Baptist churches that preach the Gospel, baptize believers and teach them the truth, the Word of God, I hope they grow to astronomical limit. I hope they grow and start other churches and all of those things. And John the Baptist had the right perspective about it. And they, they're, they're tattling on Jesus. See, John the Baptist, you shouldn't have baptized that guy because he got popular. <laughs> you rub some of your mojo off on him, you know, and now look what's happening. How many miracles did John the Baptist do? This is one of the incredible things about John the Baptist's greatness. One of the few individuals that came as a prophet that didn't do miracles. What supernatural message did John the Baptist have? If you think about it, he did say that, you know, basically the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? Jesus Christ has come. But you could read Daniel chapter 9 and tell that. Couldn't you? I mean, Daniel chapter 9, the wise men that came from the east knew that the Messiah was born because of the prophecy of Daniel. So Daniel had already prophesied that. John the Baptist was just preaching a message which could already be known. In other words, he's going about preaching, sharing a message, and the message is a message that anyone could know. Let's stop there for a second, then let's make that a point of application, shall we? Listen, for you to be an effective witness, you don't need to write a new gospel. You don't need to come up with the freshest way of sharing the gospel. There are individuals that we just say, oh, he's brilliant. I never thought of sharing the gospel like that. The gospel's the gospel. Some folks, the way that they come into conversation or the way that they encounter people or the way that they, uh, the, the way they preach the gospel to people, the way that they come about getting to preach the gospel, some of it's clever, some of it's brilliant. But can I say to you that the gospel's the same? It's Jesus. Salvation is believing in Jesus. So there's no presentation of the gospel that's yours. The message is who Jesus is. Anybody can preach the gospel. Anyone can say, Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. He died for your sins. And receiving salvation, being saved, is a matter of faith, believing in Jesus. Would you believe in Jesus? Anybody can say that. Anyone can tell somebody that and see someone get saved. Is it so? Absolutely. So there's nothing brilliant about John's message. If you think about it, there's nothing really prophetic about John's message. Now we know John was filled with the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said John was the greatest man that ever lived. That's a pretty incredible statement, isn't it? If I'm going to compare guys, I mean, Elijah called down fire from heaven. Elisha took his garment and smote the water and it just split. Moses stretched out his rod over the Red Sea. and the, and the I mean, that's probably up there, isn't it? As far as like great events. You know, the Red Sea, walking through on dry land and then the Egyptians drowning when it closed together after they passed through. That's a big deal. John the Baptist... I baptize you in the name of Jesus. Just dunking people. That's all he did. And he didn't have nice clothes. I mean, that's the only thing remarkable about John the Baptist. And friend, herein I find, okay, well then if it's fancy clothes that are required, I may not have nice enough ones. Anybody could probably get a camel skin. Maybe. I'm going to try and get me one. Someday I want to preach in a camel skin. <laughs> I do. You, you give me a camel suit, and I mean a, like a camel skin suit. I'll wear it, folks. I'll just tell you that. I'll wear it frequently. All right. People probably would come to see that, wouldn't they? All right. Maybe that'll be our next outreach event. <laughs> All right. We'll we'll do it on Wednesdays because it's hump day. All right. So, <laughs> chapter three of John again. All right. So. In verse 26, here's what they said. They came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, or teacher. That's what they called Jesus, wasn't it? He that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth. And all men come to him. John, they're following him. They're not following you. They are following him. John answered and said, 
A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You know, sometimes we think we're God's gift. Don't we? Or worse yet, sometimes we think we're a gift to God. Sometimes we think we're God's gift. Uh, this is not a comment about it, but you ever listen to Rush Limbaugh introduce himself? Talent on loan from God. You know? <laughs> And he introduces himself as talent on loan from God. Hopefully that's a statement of humility, saying nothing I have or I do is anything more than God allows. But maybe it's not. I don't know. His heart. Uh, but how about this? God, I'm here for you. John the Baptist said, a man can't do anything. He doesn't have anything that isn't given to him. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You know, there are individuals who honestly believe that it is by their wit, by their intellect, by their skill, by their strength, that they have achieved what they've accomplished. You ever met somebody that in man's eyes have accomplished great things? Somebody that uh, that needs to think that they're not normal in their rights? Like, no, you're not as good as me. I have achieved more than you have. I've known some wealthy individuals, had some friends that are wealthy, like, you know, where they're in the hundreds of millions of dollars kind of wealthy. And one of the things that I've noticed that they have in common is a real inferiority complex. They really need, now, now I'm not saying it's true of every single person that's extremely wealthy, but the ones that I've met for the most part need to think that they're better than you. In other words, they'll go to lunch with you, they'll talk to you, they'll be your friend, but ultimately they want you to know I can buy a car that's better than any car you can buy. And I can live in a house that's better than any house that you can live in. Ultimately, they need to, for you to know that we're not the same. I'm better. And what's interesting is they live nearby other people that are the same as they are, and they all compare each other. I had a, a wealthy man tell me about a, a board meeting that he was at in a, uh, in a, a penthouse. He was just penthouse owners, and one guy wanted to speak up and say something, and a guy stood up and said, you're only worth, and it was something like $25 million or something. He was like, you're only worth $25 million. You know, like, you know, you don't get to speak at this board meeting. You're not anybody. You're not as good as we are. Because that's all you're worth, $25 million, something like that. You know, I've noticed that, that we all tend to kind of want to feel superior. We all kind of, we, you know, it's really an inferiority complex, but a lot of us have a superiority complex. We need to compare ourselves in some ways. You know, guys, male posturing. You ever get around, you know, and you know, pretty soon you get a bunch of guys together without ladies around, pretty soon they're going to be arm wrestling, you know, or, <laughs> or doing something to show off that I can do something, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm whatever, than everybody else. That's just, that, you know, I think that God, for good reasons, made a lot of us that way. But everybody kind of has it. You know what John the Baptist said? He said, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. You know why John the Baptist was greater than everybody else? is because he realized they didn't have anything that was because of himself. If you ever accomplish anything for God, my friend, it won't be because, you know, God, did you know, did you realize what kind of a package I ended up being? The skill that I had, the way that I presented and put it together. You see what I've done? No, you'll never do anything for God that you haven't done by His ability, by His power. My friend, you and I need to know about God's grace. Listen, you're tall, you're short, you're, uh, you are well-spoken, well-versed. You are influential, you're popular, you're whatever you are. My friend, it's not because of anything but other than what God gave you. That's it. And John the Baptist is expected to be upset that Jesus now has his disciples following Jesus, and Jesus is now making more disciples than John the Baptist. It's the most natural thing in the world. I mean, he's God. <laughs> I'm just a man. You cannot serve God and please Him with the expectation that what you do is anything more than what you've done through what He's given you. God's not going to say, wow, you know, I can't believe you did that. That's, wow, that's amazing. You know what impresses God? Faith. What is faith? Well, believing that God can. God, I'm going to invite my friend to come, and I don't have the words to say, 
and so I'm just going to have to trust you to give me words that are beyond my wisdom. I believe you can, God. And then when you do it, you say, man, you know, I, the, the cleverest thing happened. I can't believe I, I just I came up with this. No, God gave you wisdom. You ever done something that had you been had you been asked beforehand, you'd be you were asked, could you do this? You ever accomplished something as bigger or greater than what you thought you could do? Succeeded at something? And of course you're like, wow, you know, <laughs> pretty impressive. No. Because God gave you ability. How many times I've just told God, God, the task is greater than I am, and it's evidently something that I'm not qualified for, and so I just need you to do it. And God, I'm a willing instrument. You can use me to do it, but it's going to have to be you doing it. About halfway through, I'm like, wow, you know, I'm doing this. No. God's doing it. See, John the Baptist realized that no person is anything that he has not been given. Even your what you think are natural strengths and abilities, my friend, are God-given. And if you don't believe that, someday probably something will happen in your life to take away what you think you have. I remember the days when I thought I was a wit. I thought I was clever. And uh, I, I thought I had a good sense of humor. And I remember the days when I was growing up when my dad would ask me for details about all kinds of things because I could remember everything. I've lost my mind. <laughs> I mean, I'm not smart enough to be clever anymore. Uh, I can't remember things. And you know, you can tell me the same joke every single week and I'll laugh because I've never heard it before. You know, <laughs> that's how clever I am. You know, sometimes God will just let you know, you know, something you don't have a mind unless I let you. You ever lost strength or ability? You know, I can lift just about anything that an average man can't. Unless my back's out. Or unless something's broken. And it just happens, something just randomly breaks on me all the time. And you know something, you realize I can't lift anything unless God just gives me the ability to do it. And I don't have that ability every day. Like God will bring you to a place, my friend, if you're mistaken about your physical ability or your mental ability, God will bring you to a place when you realize, I can't do anything unless God just lets me. I can't breathe. This is real because of some of the guys in our church right now, Brother Stanley and Brother Rod, uh, who are you know struggling with respiratory issues. And I'm just humbled when I look at guys that can't breathe and I realize there's no difference between a person who can't breathe without a machine and me. It's just God just lets me. That's all it is. I could lose the ability to breathe just like that and be totally incapacitated by it. And it's just a reality. I just, it's just it ought to be humbling to us. And John the Baptist, they said, you know, Jesus is greater than you now, John. And he's supposed to get all bent out of shape and upset about it. And he said, a man can receive nothing except be given him from heaven. He said, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. Remember he said, he that is after me is preferred before me. We read that twice today, didn't we? In John chapter 1. John said, you heard me say that I am sent before him and I'm not the Christ. He said, "He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend is, or I'm sorry, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice." Here is a second characteristic uh, of John's greatness. John not only understood that he couldn't do anything unless God gave him the ability to do it. He also understood what it was to rejoice for the person whose right it was to have joy. You ever met the angry person at the wedding? If you've been to as many weddings as I have, you've met the like the, the, the wedding tyrant. You know, they have you know, on the bright side, Bridezilla is what they call her nowadays. But I'm talking about the person that tries to be the main person at the wedding. It's not usually the best man, oftentimes it's the maid of honor that, you know, it's like she wants to look better than the bride. And I mean she makes it a special she she makes sure you know she's there doing stuff for the bride. And I think mostly what she's saying is, I'm available. I can do weddings. Uh, you know, whatever it is. 
But the reality of it is, is that in a wedding of friends and where things are all what they're supposed to be, who are we happy for? We're happy for the bride, we're happy for the groom, aren't we? You know, nobody goes to the, you know, well, I don't know, this is the, you know, if anyone has any objections, speak now or forever, hold your peace. I haven't gotten to do one of those weddings in a long time. But, you know, where, you know, you're about to marry and then, you know, the, the one that truly loves the bride is going to stand up and say, hold it right now, you only love him, or he's only, you're only marrying him because of money, but I'm really a better man. And whatever, you know, the Hallmark movie, however it puts it, you know. Uh, so whatever whatever the case is, the reality of it is uh, in, a, in a right wedding, who's the happiest person there? Well, you hope the happiest person there is the, uh, is the bridegroom. A bride's never happy on her wedding day. It's stressful. But the, you hope that the bridegroom is happy because he's getting his bride. And you know who the second happiest person ought to be? It ought to be his best man. Like, man... Good for you. You know, gave up your man card. Game over. Good. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> Good for you. You know, I'm so happy. Honestly, you know, when you love your friend and when you know they've met the right person and you get to be the best man at the wedding, you're just like, man, I'm just so happy for you. That's just wonderful. John the Baptist says, you know, how in the world could I be envious of God? And he said, you know, if I am... If you'd understand the illustration of a bridegroom, hey, I'm not marrying her. By the way, you don't want to marry the church. <laughs> Only Jesus can sanctify the church. <laughs> right? Uh, but John the Baptist said, I'm rejoicing for Jesus. Of course, the ability to say, it's not about me, it's about Jesus, and I'm happy for him. If you ever do a good job of pointing people to Jesus, when people are first saved, it's sort of like they have training wheels on, right? You know, they need to be directed. They need to be taught. In many ways, you're the person that led them to the Lord, and they look at you for spiritual food. You teach them how to read the Bible. You teach them how to pray. You teach them how to study. Uh, you teach them about fellowship with God and believers. You teach them about going to church. You teach them about baptism. You teach them all the basic steps. And then all of a sudden, one day... You know, you realize they say, hey, you going to such and such event? And you're like, well, I couldn't go. And they're like, well, I'm going. And they're off without you, serving God. Mm -hmm. And they don't call you anymore with Bible questions because they have the answers. And they, you know, they have their own relationship with God. And all of a sudden, it's kind of like they've got their own wings. They don't need their training wheels anymore. And all of a sudden, you're like, man, they don't even remember all I did for them. I, you know, I, I, I studied with them. I sacrificed them. I did all these things for them. And it's like they just forgot me. Well, that's because they got to know Jesus. And friend, Jesus is better than you. And He's better than me too. And if somebody really gets to know Jesus, they're not going to be impressed with me. Nor will they be impressed with you. It doesn't mean, oh, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, John, we, your ministry, we don't need it. No, don't need it anymore. He said, behold the Lamb of God. And they said, well, thank you for showing me. Off I go. And they beheld the Lamb of God. And John he said, A servant's not greater than his master, nor a disciple uh, his, his Lord. Uh, look at verse 30, and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll just we'll summarize this morning. John simply said this, He must increase, but I must decrease. This is probably, for me, one of the most helpful ministry verses possible. The ability to decrease is one of the things that made John the Baptist great. John the Baptist was great because he knew that nothing he had came from himself. It was God-given. Mm -hmm. He was great because he had the ability to rejoice for the bridegroom. In other words, to say, you know what, Jesus, I can rejoice for you. But John the Baptist's true achievement for greatness was the ability to decrease. To just say, you know something? My task is to get out of the way. Now, do you remember Isaiah chapter 40? Who John the Baptist was? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every mountain, what is it? Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain shall be made low. The crooked way uh, made straight. John the Baptist's job was to make a straight path to Jesus. 
Sometimes a straight path, Jesus says, come on, here's Jesus. Come on, here's Jesus. Oh, you see Him? Get out of the way. Just, just get out of the way. And friend, what John the Baptist was great at was making disciples, wasn't it? You think about it. He had all these disciples. Remember when Jesus' disciples came to Him and, he said, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray as... You know this? John, John the Baptist also taught His disciples. He was a great teacher. John the Baptist was. But the thing that made him great was he could teach people to the place that he could hand them over. Say, now let me show you. This is Jesus. Now, take his hand. Okay, you got it? All right. Go ahead. You know, sometimes we want to win people to us. Maybe our church. Maybe our ministry. You know... Every one of us, every one of you ought to want to be a Sunday school teacher so that you can teach people. Do you know what you're trying to do in your class when you're Sunday? You're not trying to have the biggest class. You're trying to take them to the next level. You're trying to take them through the class so you can hand them off. And ultimately, where are you handing people off to? Jesus. And John the Baptist said, He must increase, but I must decrease. Friend, do you know how to decrease? When I think of decreasing, I don't think of Martha. Now, maybe it's just the plays that people do about Mary and Martha, but you see Martha just busy bustling around. You ever meet the bustling around person? The person that's really busy. Sometimes she's in a restaurant working out as a waitress, and she's the person that can't do anything without being noticed. And she's got to, like, she walks down the deal, she's got to talk to everybody in every table, greet everybody, make sure people know that she's there. And then, you want more water? You know, like, just... Put the water there. You don't need to ask for more water. You want more to, can I get you anything, hon? You know, and, and it becomes all about that person and what they're doing. And you're trying to have, you try to go to a restaurant so you can have a conversation with someone, so you pick one where you know there's not loud music or whatever, and then you've got a loud waiter or waitress. Sometimes you have a waitress that wants to sit down at the table with you, huh. like in chat. You know, and if you say, hey, sit down and talk to us, you know, that's one thing, right? I don't think I've ever said that to a waitress, but... You know, sit down, you know, but they just sit down and it's all of a sudden they're dominating your conversation. It's like, you know, we got a Martha syndrome here. We got somebody that needs to be noticed. Need to know how great you are. You know, believer, we need churches full of people that don't need to be noticed. We need people that just, just say, you know, that needs to be done, and nobody needs to know who did it. I'll do it. And just have the decreasing attitude. I have to think sometimes really, really hard to think of the most influential people in my life. Because they were like John the Baptist. Whereas you never really think a lot of, of a decreasing personality. A person who is, I want to point him to Jesus so I don't want to be noticed. And I promise you, humanly speaking, if you think someone is a great minister for God, they're probably not. think, wow, you know, I mean, the way they lead in worship, yeah, the way they get up front and perform. Mm. Wow, the way that they, you know, that they speak and the way that person can hold a crowd in his hand and he can draw the conclusions, the way he can, yeah, you know, the way that he can get people to focus on him. And John the Baptist had the ability to get people to forget about him. Next week we'll look at that part. We'll look at that second part. We'll look at some of the struggles of John the Baptist, the things that make him relatable. Let's go back to Stick Sticks, if you would, please. Matthew 11, 11. I'll mess you guys up, too, like my roommate did. It should be coffee break every day. 11, 11 a.m. Matthew 11, 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, and then Jesus said, Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, when Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven here, he is not referring to the angels. He's referring to individuals that are part of God's economy. How do we get to be part of God's economy? The kingdom of heaven. Well, you've got to be a believer in Jesus. So the first thing that Jesus points out is that there's nobody on earth that's greater than someone in heaven. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know, all you got to do to be greater than John the Baptist on earth is to make it. 
You know, that's kind of comforting for me. In other words, you know, there are individuals that believe in degrees in heaven, degrees in hell, it's nonsense. The fact is, is that in heaven we're there. God rewards individuals in heaven. Andy, you taught him to cry like that, didn't you? Yeah. When we get to heaven, uh, when we get to heaven, the greatest person on earth will still be a sinner. We'll still have doubts, we'll still whatever. And friend, one of the encouraging things I find is that someday, just basic status, basic level, I'm going to be greater than John the Baptist in heaven. Now that's a help to me for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's because that's my future outcome because I'm a believer. If you know Jesus as your Savior, that's your future outcome, and that'll be really encouraging. It's second, it's encouraging to me uh, secondarily because uh, it makes John the Baptist more relatable to me. It's just a person. It's just a person. He's a person who Jesus said on earth <coughs> understood decreasing in a way that no one else did. <clears throat> he understood exalting Jesus better than anyone else. But you know, I could do the same thing if I strive for it. One of the greatest, <coughs> one of the greatest things I can do to help myself with my mindset or my attitude is anything that I'm endeavoring to do for the Lord Jesus just to go ahead and put a stamp on the whole plan. He must increase. I must decrease. I'm not doing this it's because it's about me. You know, I've said a lot of times, it's not about you. Sometimes we're, we're trying to work. I'm trying to work with people. We're trying to do some things. People are like, well, I don't know about this. It's not about you. That's not why we're doing this. We're not doing VBS for you. We're not doing teen activity for the teen leaders. We're not doing uh, church outreach for the church. It's not about us. Who is it about? Well, it's about Jesus and decreasing enough so that people can know Him. And if people know us, it's not wrong for someone to know that I've been involved in their life or helped them. But what I want to be known for is being the person that took their hand and put it in Jesus' hand. Did the handoff. He must increase. I must decrease. And that is the sole element about John the Baptist that made him great. And as great as he was, my friend, he was human. The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist, and that's your outcome as well. Father, thank you for what we've learned today. And I ask that you would just go with us, help us with this mindset to be able to serve you with this attitude. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're not going to have a uh, come forward invitation or anything like that. Uh, if you have any questions about the message or anything that you need help with, I'm available uh, all, all day long. Well, all day when I'm not preaching, but you can call or text or you can talk to me while we're here and I want you to know uh, that I'm, we're always available for any kind of help that you could need. You're dismissed.